All right, it's my pleasure to introduce student Dr. Nassim Bassett. Student Dr. Bassett is a KCU Anatomy Fellow. She was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, and graduated from AM with the class of 2017 with a biomedical science degree. In her gap year, she worked as a clinical data specialist at UT Southwest Comprehensive Cancer Center, where she was first introduced to the endeavor of research. She's currently interested in OBGYN or general surgery and is working with Dr. Melanie Meister, a urogynecologist at KU, to complete her year-long project regarding female urinary stress incontinence. Aside from academics, Nelson enjoys dancing to Bollywood music and spending quality time with her friends and family. The title of student Dr. Bassett's talk is Relationship of the Retropubic Vessels to tension-free vaginal tape needle site and the bony pelvis in female cadavers. Student doctor, take it away. All right, let me share my screen real fast. Wait, that's not it, hold on. Wait, it is. Are you guys seeing my PowerPoint? Yes. With my notes? No, okay. that's okay, the awesome. right one. Perfect. Okay. So thanks for the introduction. Um, like he said, my name is Nasheen Bassett and I'm one of the KC Anatomy Fellows on the Kansas City campus. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So my study is, or my title, the title of my project is called A Study on the Relationship of Retropubic Vessels to Pelvic Size During Sling Placement. Um, I'd like to give a quick shout out to student Dr. Soraya Ramirez, Nafis Dean, Dr. Seegers, Dr. Olinger, and Dr. Meister. And of course, oh, there you go, okay. So here's my abstract with the IBC, IBC number. I sent this out in my email yesterday. So if you'd like to go back and reference at any point, it is there. So I'm gonna start off with a quick vascular anatomy overview within the human pelvis. Um, so the abdominal aorta, which is right here, I hope you can see my arrow. <laughs> Um, it's going to divide into the common iliac arteries and the common iliac arteries are going to further divide into the external and internal iliac arteries. So here on this left image, we see branches of the external iliac artery as well as femoral arteries. So once it passes that inguinal ligament, it then changes name. And then if you're on the right, we have branches of the internal iliac arteries. So what I have highlighted in yellow are the arteries that I'm specifically interested in. So we have the external iliac artery itself. A branch off of that is called the inferior epigastric artery. Then we have a branch, branch off of the femoral artery called the superficial epigastric artery right here. And then on this right image, we have the obturator artery. That's a branch of, of the internal iliac artery, the anterior division of it. So this obturator artery is going to go into the obturator canal along with the obturator nerve. So you'll see why here in a second, why these four arteries are the ones that I'm interested in for my project. So let me go ahead and give an introduction of the retropubic mid-urethral sling. This is a surgical procedure done for the treatment of urinary stress incontinence. Urinary stress incontinence is defined as the unintentional uh, loss of bladder control during times of increased pressure, such as when someone's sneezing, walking, running, laughing, et cetera. Um, this occurs when the pelvic floor muscles weaken and is usually more commonly diagnosed in females. So as you can imagine, as a female ages, um, for example, like birth and hysterectomies, all these can cause the pelvic floor muscles to weaken and therefore causes a urinary stress incontinence. Um, placement of the sling involves using a trocar that enters the vaginal epithelium, goes into the retropubic space and comes out the abdominal, abdominal wall, um, usually comes out two centimeters lateral to midline. Um, one important thing to note during this procedure is the importance of keeping that trocar needle right up against the pubic bone. Um, so that we don't get other further complications. So this inserting the needle provides, or sorry, creates two tunnels to allow for this mesh to uh, be placed. And the mesh is gonna actually hold, lift up this urethra to stop the flow of urine during those instances of increased abdominal pressure. Um, a well-known complication of this procedure is the retropubic hematoma. And that is what we're gonna be discussing. So that procedure, the retropubic sling is brought about in 1996 by Elmston and Petros. And since then it's been widely used uh, and it's been a popular treatment for um, women with urinary stress incontinence. So here we see a study done by Flock. Uh, it's titled the hemorrhagic complications associated with tension-free vaginal tape procedure. And in this study, 
the 336 patients were, or sorry, the, that trocar or the mesh was placed in 336 patients. And of the student 336 patients, 14 of them had a hematoma. Of the 14, 10 um, had resulted in a volume of 40 to 200 milliliters, and four of them resulted in a blood volume of 300 to 1,000 milliliters. Those with a hematoma size of greater than 300 milliliters were in severe pain and required surgical removal of the hematoma. So as you can see, this is very serious, and that is why we wanted to look into doing a project based on this hematoma. Um, later on, Muir did a study uh, on the vessels in the retropubic region, and his study was called The Relationship of Tension-Free Vaginal Tape Insertion and the Vascular Anatomy. So in his study, he found the vessels that are at risk for puncture in this retropubic region, and it's the four that I had mentioned in the previous slide. So the aim of our study is to further clarify the relationship between these four major vessels and the trocar needle site, and to determine if there is a correlation with the uh, pelvic AP diameter, as well as the interspinous distance of the ischium. Um, our aim is to have a better understanding of the vascular anatomy of the females with different pelvic sizes and to in, in order to decrease complications of this um, retropubic hematoma that's associated with the procedure. So for objective and hypothesis, um, in our study, we aim to further explore the vascular anatomic relationship to the trocar tract in the retropubic space and to determine if there is a relationship between the vascular structures and the bony landmarks of the pelvis. Our hypothesis is that there are pelvic measurements that could be used to establish which patients are more at risk for developing a hematoma, and therefore the surgeon should be extra cautious and follow strict guidelines when placing the mesh. So our study is clinically important because if we can find a correlation with these vessels and the measurements of the bony pelvis, then this may represent a clinically useful measure that we can use um, to determine which patients are at more risk of developing a hematoma. So moving on to material and methods, we, for our study, we used 13 female formalin embalmed cadavers and all measurements were taken bilaterally. We used standard dissection tools found in the gross anatomy lab. Digital caliper was used for measurement and all measurements were taken by a single investigator, which in this case was me. Um, due to the limited number of cadavers on the Kansas City campus, we did not use, we didn't really use an exclusion criteria. We only had a limited number of female cadavers on our campus, so we did try to use the most of them that we could. We weren't, allowed, we weren't able to use the camp, uh, sorry, the cadavers on the Joplin campus because we needed Dr. Meister to insert the trocars and she was unable to travel down there. So we kept all the female cadavers and we did not have exclusion criteria. So continue with the methods. To begin, we had, like I mentioned, Dr. Melanie Meister, she came in and she placed this trocar needle um, exactly how it's normally performed using the surgical guidelines. We placed our bodies in lithotomy position. Um, and then we inserted this trocar needle right here that you see in this image through the vaginal epithelium behind the retropubic space and out the abdominal wall. And again, this was two centimeters lateral from midline. Um, Instead of leaving the trocar there to take our measurements, we left a piece of twine in its place as reference for the measurement, just because we were limited to the number of trocars that we have, as well as the fact that the first years were still gonna do dissection. So it was definitely unsafe to leave the trocar there. Once the trocar was placed, we carefully dissected out the vessels using standard dissection tools that were found in the anatomy lab. And using a digital caliper, we measured the distances of these, the vessels to the trocar of all four arteries. So here in uh, image A, we have the inferior epigastric artery that's marked in orange arrow. And we have, sorry, that's a superficial epigastric artery in the orange. And the inferior epigastric that's marked here in the green. We have the external iliac artery that's marked here in the black arrow. And then in figure B, we have the obturator artery going into the obturator canal. Um, we took these measurements from the trocar to the arteries in which the vessel is closest to the trocar site and in, pl in a plane parallel to the floor. So once all the artery measurements were taken, we then measured the female pelvic AP diameter. So here in A, we see the measurement that we took for the AP diameter, which is taken from the sacral promontory to the inferior edge of that pubic ramus. We also took the interspinous distance of the ischium measurement. So as you see in figure B, from one ischial spine to the other. The reason that we chose these two measurements for our study is because they could easily, easily be taken clinically by the surgeon and it's not invasive. Um, 
So, and then once we gathered all this data, we entered it into Microsoft Excel and we used IBM SPSS version 23 for Windows to run our descriptive, descriptive statistics, our independent t-test, as well as our Spearman correlation. So for the results, all arteries that we measured were found to be located lateral to the trocar site and two were also found to be cephalad. Um, here we have in table one, the mean and standard deviation of each of the arteries measured. And what we see is that the obturator artery is the closest to that trocar needle site at 30.6 millimeters plus or minus 5.19. The superficial epigastric and inferior epigastric are relatively in close distances away. And the greatest distance away was the external iliac artery measuring 48.08 millimeters plus or minus 9.64. What we have in table two is an independent t-test but of all the right and left arteries. And what we see is that there are not, there's no statistical significance between the left and right measurements. So with that said, what we did is we went ahead and combined the, num the measurements that we got for the left and right of each artery and then correlated that to the measurements of the bony pelvis. The, so here we have Spearman correlation study of the arteries to the pelvic AP diameter. The mean of the pelvic AP diameter that we measured was 113.99, plus or minus 7.99 millimeters. Um, what we see here is that the distance between each of the arteries measured and the trocar was correlated to three of the arteries. And the one that was not correlated was the superficial epigastric artery. Um, we also see that this external iliac artery was significant at less than 0.01 level. But the three of them, so the inferior epigastric, the external iliac, and the obturator were all, were all statistically significant and correlated to the AP pelvic diameter. Here we have a Spearman correlation study of the arteries to the interspinous distance now. Um, the mean interspinous distance that we measured was 111.1 plus or minus 7.14 millimeters. Um, what we see in this graph is that this was not statistically significant um, or cor sorry, statistically correlated with any of the artery measurements. Interestingly, we did find some inverse correlations as well. So now for discussion, uh, major vascular injuries have occurred as a result of these retropubic medial sling placements um, resulting in the retropubic hematoma, which can require surgical intervention. What we see in chart one is on the x-axis, we have the AP pelvic diameter, and on the y-axis, we have the vessel distances from the trocar. And consistent with that Muir study that we talked about earlier, the obturator artery is the closest and the external iliac artery is the furthest away from the trocar needle site. Um, what we see here as well is that this, as the AP diameter increases, that does not change. So we still have the obturator artery being the closest and the external iliac artery, artery being the furthest away. The inferior and superficial epigastric arteries were pretty similar distances away. Um, so this graph is showing that positive correlation between the pelvic AP diameter and the vessel distances that we found. So interestingly enough, while we were doing our dissections, what we found is something called corona, mor corona mortis. And corona mortis is an anatomical variation of the obturator artery. And it's seen coming off of this uh, inferior epigastric artery and going into this obturator canal. This corona mortis has been discussed before. However, we didn't think it was that common. So I did not expect to see what we found was 13, or sorry, three of our 13 cadavers had this corona mortis. So we think that corona mortis could be another potential reason why injuries to the obturator artery is more likely to occur with placement of the sling, since this anatomical variation is not taken into account when placing this mesh. So for limitations of our study, or some of the limitations of our study, is the use of formalin embalmed cadaveric tissue, which does not always represent the natural relationship of a fresh tissue, the age and human population studied, the small sample size, unknown patient urogynecologic history, and dissections could have also altered the surrounding tissue, which resulted in skewed measurements, and of course, as always, the possibility of human error. So for future direction, um, future areas of study should include viewing, viewing the vessel via an ultrasound, um, repeating it with fresh cadaveric tissue to measure the distances more accurately, 
studying the retropubic veins, which I think would be really interesting to do just because since we all know hematomas can result in any type of injury to any blood vessel, and all we have in the literature is discussing the arteries, but we have not discussed any of the veins that could be associated to this complication. So that has yet to be assessed. I think that'd be a really cool direction to take that or take the study. Um, to get a more diverse sample, since most of our cadavers were in the older age range as well as Caucasian, and then to exclude patients with previous gynecologic surgery, which again, we didn't do because we were limited to the amount of information that we had, but also that we, were, we only had 13 cadavers, so we didn't really include that exclusion criteria. Um, some of the journals that I'm interested in getting my research published would be the Clinical Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology, Journal of Gynecologic Surgery, and American Journal of Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology. That's a hard word for me. <laughs> So to conclude, major vascular structures lie in close proximity to the path of the trocar used in placement of retropubic mid-urethral slings for treatment of urinary stress incontinence. The female pelvic AP diameter is correlated with the distance between these vessels and the trocar and may represent a clinically useful measurement to determine which patients are at risk. So for our study, we found a novel comparison between these distances of the arteries and the trocar path um, and the measurements of the bony pelvis. The AP pelvic diameter could uh, alone provide insight to map the relationship between the uh, female pelvic size and distance of the vessels away. We cannot say the same about the interspinous distance since, since we did not find any kind of correlation there. Um, this relationship could be useful for surgeons to predict which patients may be at risk of vascular injury and the retropubic hematoma development. Here are my references and now I'll be open to questions. We've got plenty of time for questions. Go ahead and raise your hand. Or feel free to just chime in. I'll chime in. Can you go back, can you go back to your uh, limitations slide? Yes, I can. I think I stopped sharing. Let me share it again. This one? Yep. Um, so just for the sake of when we go to put this into a manuscript, use of a formalin cadaver, uh, formalin balm cadaver is not a limitation. I mean, they're, and the way you do that is because, I mean, I've been doing this forever, and there are several studies that cite that the difference between it being formalin fixed versus fresh versus, uh, uh, like soft preserved, it doesn't alter to a degree that it would be listed as a limitation in a study. Okay. Age, definitely. Uh, I was iffy about the small sample size because I know I've, I've read so many cadaveric studies and they're all pretty limited. Yeah, uh, it's not, I, I like if you had 20 or 30, I would say you shouldn't have it in there, but 13 is pretty small, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, you could leave. Uh, the unknown history definitely should leave. Uh, when you say dissections may have altered the surrounding tissue, what specifically, like? Well, so whenever we took measurements of these arteries, like we tried to keep them carefully exactly where they were placed, but sometimes it was a little hard because not only are we probably, as we're teasing through the tissue, we might be moving it a little bit, but also since the first years we're dissecting this, uh, these, this region, like especially the abdomen, before I yeah. even got to this um, me taking measurements, that could have also altered our measurements. So maybe, um, and then human error, I don't think you need to list that as a limitation either. Unless okay. you're not having robots run your next project. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so take a Thank you. <laughs> uh, other than that, I thought that was a very good talk. I was really uh, pleased with the presentation. It looked really good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Tatiana? Hi, I don't have a question. Just wanted to say great job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's, let's thank uh, student Dr. Bassett. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending today. Really appreciate it.